Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Ham Nation is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by DX Engineering. DX Engineering offers practically everything you need to outfit your shack, plus the fastest shipping in the industry. In stock items ship the same day, Monday through Friday until 10 p.m. Eastern. For more information, visit dxengineering.com slash ham nation. And by ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash ham nation. This is Ham Nation, episode 204 for July 8th, 2015. Katie and Val explain Ham Radio Deluxe. Hello, everybody. From rainy, rainy Ozarks, it's Bob Heil, K9EID, and you are in tune with Ham Nation. And I am so happy tonight we're going to have some real special guests and, uh, you know, kind of wind up the field day stuff. Uh, before I get over to those guests, everybody's asking me, what's happened with the rain? Let me show you what happened. The pictures aren't great. But this is taken from the road. Uh, this is one of my, uh, or my, uh, this is one of the uh, tower, the uh, uh, telephone poles for my phased array. Okay? That happened, or that picture was taken where this one was taken hours afterwards. And let me tell you, there is some water there. Wow. The old creek came and away we went. So uh, I was very lucky. There's uh, some, uh, there are containers down there that have my relay systems in them uh, for the phased array switching, but nothing was hurt. Everything's cool. Water receded, but boy, it's rain every day as it is everywhere. Let's go bopping around here and see what's happening. First of all, we'll uh, take off and go up to Wisconsin, ladies no, first. Illinois. <laughs> Illinois. Illinois I, I, I can't get you out of Wisconsin yet. How are you doing, Valerie? I'm doing great, Bob. Had a great time for field day, and I had a really good 4th of July. And I know somebody yeah. else that had a really good 4th of July. If you want to show this slide, Brian. This is my friend, uh, Ward Silver, uh, no, November Zero Alpha X-ray. He portrayed Abraham Lincoln, and he was pounding out the Gettysburg Address there on CW, and he was also doing that on 20 and 40 meters the morning of the 4th of July, so maybe a lot of you guys heard him out there, but I thought that was pretty incredible, especially since most of us don't even know the Gettysburg Address on phone, so here he is doing it on uh, CW, so I thought that was pretty uh, much in the spirit of the holiday, so that was pretty cool. Good piece, good piece. And I understand that you're going to have somebody to help you tonight with your segment, and that's Katie. Katie, yes. how are you? Let's get Katie in good. here. There's Hi, W Bob. Y Hi, Yeah. You're Sorry. looking good. Hi. Everything good. Yeah, everything's All right. great out here in Wyoming. And uh, you, uh, you have some things to talk about with HRD, Ham Radio Deluxe. We're looking forward to that. But before we get to it, we got one more to bring in here, and that's Don. Don, how you doing down there? And uh, is it raining? No, it's, 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 it's hot and humid the way it's supposed to be in South Mississippi. And th there's no point in even coming to me. Go back to the girls. Nobody wants to see my ugly face. We'll come back. We've got some <laughs> well, more stuff. We've got... Speaking of, speaking of the girls, we've got uh, Tamitha Scove coming up a little bit later on with the solar weather. And you remember we talked about uh, Bob had his, his contact last week with the uh, extension cord antenna. Well, we've got one that is at least as good of, as that and might even top it. And that's coming up a little bit later on. Back to you, Bob. 
Okay, very good. Well, we have so much. Dale's going to be here with a lot of videos that that uh, he uh, has been receiving. George is going to be here with his soldering iron, and uh, it's going to be a great show. So let's get moving. Valerie, you and Katie, uh, take the helm, and let's see what's going on in the great world of amateur radio. All right, well, first I'm going to start us off with some upcoming DX. Now, it's summer, so there's really not a lot of DX, but if you want to show that first slide... We have Mauritius coming up, and uh, that is, yeah, there you go, uh, 3 Bravo 8 Hotel Charlie, and that's right off the coast of Madagascar. You can go to the next one, um, and it's a pretty cool island. It looks like it has these underwater waterfalls, but that's just the way the sand is forming underneath. That's kind of cool, but he's going to be there now through the 25th, so if you need Mauritius, uh, you want to go ahead and get on the air for that. And then coming up, we have the Vatican. Uh, that's pretty cool. Now, I worked the Vatican a couple years ago. And you know what's really cool about the Vatican? They LOTW'd. So the Pope's got LOTW. How cool is that? So anyway, if you had fun for field day, your fun doesn't have to end. This weekend is the IARU HF Championship. Now, you know, field day is kind of like a contest. You get on the air and talk to as many people as you can. And, and, and so if you want to keep that going... Get on the air this week. You can do phone only. You can do CW only. You can do both. You can do low power, high power, QRP. Uh, you can go single operator assisted or single operator uh, unassisted. And uh, the, the key here is to work uh, as many zones as you can. And they use ITU zones. So if you're not sure what your ITU zone is, make sure you go on and Google ITU zone maps and figure out where you are. Most of us in the U.S. are like sevens and eights. Uh, but uh, there's 40 zones out there. So the goal is to get as many zones as you can in different continents and things like that. So uh, get out there and have some fun for that. And uh, keeping in with the spirit of all the different logging softwares that I've been uh, showcasing, this week we're going to showcase Ham Radio Deluxe, or as some call it, HRD. So if you want to roll that video. All right, let's jump right in and learn about Ham Radio Deluxe. Now, you can get a free 30-day trial, so you can try this out if you like and see what you think. I did set up my radio to interact with my computer right here on Ham Radio Deluxe, so I can control all the buttons I can on my radio right here from my computer screen. Everything from filters and modes, obviously, different antennas, things like that. I can control all that right here from my computer. I can still control it from my radio as well, but uh, from the radio here, uh, from the computer is nice. We'll set it up for CW and let's pull up Digital Master. Now this is a cool tool. Now let me get the radio set up here on the left hand side so we can uh, control the radio right here from Digital Master. And there is the radio and all the different things I can control here. It's more of a condensed version. And as you can see, all the signals down there in the waterfall, if I click on any one of those signals, my radio will go right to it. And you should start to hear some CW come through. And it, if you can see, it's starting to decode up there uh, on the right-hand side of the computer there. Uh, it's very handy for those of you just starting out with CW. Uh, help you get your confidence up and maybe help you to get your speed up uh, with the decoding tool. Now in the middle here, you can see all the different macros. You can set all that up for sending CW. So that's very handy as well. So let's go ahead and get out of this and let's bring up Logbook. I'm gonna show you how the Logbook works here on HRD. Now when you open it up, first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is create a database. And I'm gonna show you real quick how to do that. Just click on that, file, and create a database. Click create. And we're going to call it NV9L. And I'm going to be importing all my logs. And hit OK. Now double click that one, hit OK. And now we're in the NV9L logbook. And we're going to go ahead and import an ADIF file. And I'm going to go grab my file of all. It's really not all. I don't have my June VHF contest from this last weekend in there or last weekend. And it's going to get it ready for upload. And then I just need to save it. 
And that's going to save. Could take a little while here because I have 30,000 of them. <laughs> In just four short years. But I wanted to give you the ability to see countries worked and things like that. All right, and that's done. And now let's go look at the log. It should populate here any second. And there you go. There's my log book. And you can just set this up to view it however you want. You can add and take fields away and uh, make the view whatever you want. I like to see if I've got my LOTW confirmation. So we can go and slide that over there. Uh, look at my QSL confirmations because I do get a lot of cards. And I want to see if I sent them uh, cards for QSLs when I sent them. So if I don't have a card yet back from them, I can track that here as well and see who I've sent cards to, um, yet I haven't received them yet. It'll show the dates I sent them, things like that. So that's really handy. You can spread it out. Bring. It, I can make this full screen too if I like. If you look real hard, you might even notice your own call signs in there because there's some of the stations I worked for the special event station. Now let's go ahead and click the awards tab and it's going to populate all the countries I have, the countries I've worked, confirmed on all the different modes and bands. So it does really good awards tracking. And you can see here on the left all the different awards you can uh, look and track. I'm also going to show you, let's close this, and I'm going to show you all the different views you can add to this screen as well. Um, uh, you can change your gray line map. If you don't like that one, you can do different gray line maps. You can, let me show, change that. And we got the little globe. And I can also add the solar propagation cycle. All kinds of different things you can add here. You can see that there's so many handy things you can bring up on your screen. And you can just set your view up however you want to see it. OK, we can go ahead and go up. And let's open up the cluster and get that all set up. We'll pick a spotting network. Hit OK. And it should show up there at the bottom. And once that shows up, I can hit connect. Get connected and you'll start to see all the spots show up. Okay, and when those cluster spots appear, those first four, four columns are going to show you if uh, these stations are the first, if you need them as a country, as for, if you need them for your new band, uh, mode, or even if it's the first time working that station. Also, you can uh, display this however you want. There's different drop downs here. You can do filters. Uh, you can set up uh, alarm, uh, work on different uh, alarm manager, uh, where you can set up uh, emails uh, if for certain spots or countries that you need. It'll send you the emails. You can even set up the voice activation so the computer will talk to you when there's a station you need. And that's the basics for Ham Radio Deluxe. Now there is a fee for this software. It's $99 for your first year and it goes down after that. Uh, but as you can see, it's very easy to use and you will have uh, great support available to you with that $99 fee. And speaking of support, I have with me Katie Allen, uh, Whiskey Yankee 7, Yankee Lima, and she's sort of the HRD guru. So. What I, I, I know I just breezed through and I wasn't able to show everything. I think I need a full hour or two to show everything. So uh, I kind of condensed what I could into five minutes. So what are some of the cool things that I might have missed? Well, thanks, Val. It, there's actually so much to this software. You probably would need about a month to be able to go through all of it because it's so comprehensive. There's five different pieces to it from rig control logging, we have the whole digital master suite. There's also satellite tracking and then the rotator management. Uh, one of the fun things I wanted to show that um, a lot of my customers really like to utilize is the lookup feature. And if we could pull up that one, um, the first photo that I sent along, I'd like to show you an example. If you use the 
QRZ XML feature, if you pay QRZ for a subscription, over there on the left, you'll see one of the windows you can add to look at is your lookup window. And almost everyone puts that in there. What's really handy is I typed in Val's call sign, as you can see. And on that left column, it's populated with tons of information about her. I can see how far away she is. I can get her email address, um, what bands I've already worked her on. I also am able to click on that QRZ.com button, if you notice at the top of that lookup panel, and that opens up a mini browser window within the logging program. So now I can also have access to her QRZ page. So I can check her out and see how awesome she is and how she's completely spanking <laughs> me on lookups on QRZ. So <laughs> then also there's a button for logbook, which you'll notice is kind of grayed out because I already had selected it. And that opens up the logging window. So say I talk to Val on the air and I just click add and then here's my window and it's already populated with all of her information. And you can see that I actually had a QSO in there already with her back on uh, New Year's of 2014. Make my contact. Normally, if I was tracking my radio, the frequency and band would already be filled in. And then I just hit F7 and it goes right into my log. Piece of cake. It's really nice and simple. Then there's also many features there you can see we you know you could really mine down how much information you want to track about your contacts but it's really handy that way and that's probably one of the most um easy features that people are really happy with um there's also one click upload to logbook of the world um one of the easiest things to do is just get it set. it's not no, always so easy sorry but once we get you all set up it's just one click to upload and download also you can do auto uploads to eqsl and um, one of the other things I wanted to show, because we didn't talk about it at all, and it's a really cool piece of the software that a lot of people enjoy, um, and that's in the next photo, and that's our satellite tracking package. And what I did was I pulled up the ISS, and I pulled it up so you could see tracking it for two hours. And if you notice, you can see a little house there. That's my house in Wyoming. And I brought up the rotator, so if I'm actually able to rotate it, you can see the frequencies. There I am taking up a big part of Wyoming. And then there's the tracking for the ISS. So you can really kind of keep an eye on it and then run out and grab them if you want. So there's so many different pieces to it. You can track the variety of them. On the, on the right side of that piece, you'll see the next passes that are coming up. So then you'll know when they're gonna be right overhead and when you can see them, that little sun and the moon are kind of fun. You can really have an idea of where you are in the world. But it's a really handy feature and it's very popular. Um, whether or not you're actually making the contact, a lot of people like to keep it up just to see what's going on out there. So that's just a you know a little piece of it um, of this of major software. A um, couple of other things that are really handy is if you have more than one ham in the house, like Val and I both do, you can also have um, more than one license for you for the software. So you can have multiple users on the piece of software, which is really handy. And then also, of course, you have tech support. That's one of the differences with our software is that you get live people on the phones to help you like myself and also Tim, KB3NPH, who's out in Pennsylvania, and our newest team member, Robin, Gulf One Mike Hotel Uniform, and he's in the UK. And so we're really excited. Our team is growing and we're expanding. We've added in um, John Henry, who's also doing some additional coding. And um, one quick thing I just wanted to throw out there is a big thank you to everybody who's watching tonight who might be interested in trying. First of all, don't forget you can try it for free for 30 days and that includes full tech support. So and that's why we want you to give it a whirl and give it a try. However, we have a great deal for you tonight. If you buy it tonight from us directly or from our friends at DX Engineering, you get 20 bucks off and you also get 15 months of support and upgrades. So it's really an awesome deal to give a world to, to this weekend. It's only 24 hours, you know, it's you know like one of those commercials on TV, buy now, but um, I promise you, give it a whirl and, and we'll be happy to help you. And that's what we're there for. And I'll tell you what, it's a, it's a great fun job. I get to talk to so many people and um, I've met a ton of people and looking forward to seeing some people at the uh, Huntsville Ham Fest coming up soon. And um, just on behalf of everybody with Ham Radio Deluxe, we really thank uh, we thank Bob and everyone here on Ham Nation for the chance to, uh, to share a little bit more work. about the about the show about the software. Well, thanks, Katie. Now, uh, one thing I did want to find out does is there a contesting aspect to the logging, the HRD? No, no, not really. Okay. We're really not built for the contesting. Yeah. 
That's someone had asked that in the chat room, so I thought I'd find out. Um, so, but you know, I want to say when I uploaded that, <clears throat> there was really no learning curve to that at all. It was really easy to use, and there were so many features. So, uh, like Katie said, uh, go ahead and give the free 30 day trial, you know, kick the tires and see what you think uh, if you're looking into a logging software. But thanks so much, Katie, for joining us. Katie, Bre Katie Allen, uh, Whiskey Yankee 7, Yankee Lima. <laughs> Thanks, Val. And I forgot to All mention, right. there's actually a coupon code to use. If you use HN for Ham Nation, then that's the uh, the special discount for everybody. Oh, very cool. Well, thanks for doing that, Katie. And thanks for joining us tonight. I appreciate that. And I did want to make a correction, too. I think I said 40 zones. There's 40 CQ zones. In IARU, we use ITU zones, and there's 90 mm -hmm. of those. So uh, sorry if I said 40. But um, I also wanted to show you my new necklace. Um. <laughs> I, I, it's from DX Engineering. Just got this in the mail. I bet you didn't know they sold jewelry. And you know how us <laughs> girls love jewelry. Well, see if you can figure out what this is, everybody out there. It's not coax. And if, if you can see, it's pretty heavy duty. This is a feed line choke. And, you know, what we have going on here, we have an 80 meter dipole and it's about 100 feet up and it's on a rope catenary uh, strung between a couple of towers. And because it's 100 feet up, we have 100 feet of coax coming down to the ground. And as you all know, uh, coax has all the metal braid in that. So there's 100 feet of that. And what that's, what's happening is um, when you have that much coax, you have re -radi uh, RF re-radiating and becoming an antenna. So every time we transmit on this dipole, our satellite TVs go off. So we got this and we're going to put this in right at the feed point. Um, between the antenna or the dipole and the coax, and that should eliminate that problem. So any of you guys out there, uh, if you're transmitting and uh, you're turning off the family TV and you're getting a lot of slack, uh, something like this should cure that. This particular one is 50 ohm. There's 100 ferrite beads in this right here, and that's why it's so heavy and so thick, but um, it's 50 ohm, so it will work on 160 meters all the way to six meters. So uh, that's pretty cool. As a matter of fact, I wonder if this would be a good homebrew project. Maybe uh, George or Randy has done this, or if not, maybe they could do it. I don't know how labor intensive it is, but maybe something to consider. But that's all I've got for tonight. So I'm going to head it over to Bob, who I understand had a, a blast at Field Day, or should I say a splash at Field Day? How was Field Day, Bob? Field day was great. <laughs> yes, I got to uh, visit a lot of sites, and uh, we, I know we went through them last week, but uh, I, uh, I kind of uh, backed up and said, no, there were more to do, so we're going to have some more tonight. So let's run through those quickly, Brian. These are all uh, stations from the good old Ozarks. Uh, Nixa was the first one. Nixa's a great club in uh, Nixa, Missouri. And uh, Bill Smith and I trying to figure out what we're going to do next. <laughs> it was a wonderful day. No rain, and uh, it wasn't really hot. That's, uh, that was one good thing. They, uh, Nixa Club, they, uh, they had a, a van from the state police, and it was all decked out with um, wonderful things as well as that hydraulic uh, lift for the antenna for six meters. And uh, they were able to be in there. That's the go-to station with my friend Al, W0ERE. And I was just getting that 440 set up for the go-to. Uh, this is from down in Aurora. I mean, this is a true, this is a true field day setup. They're out in the field. And uh, <clears throat> they had that box. That isn't something from Doctor Who. It isn't something else. And if you're going to do field day and have a barbecue uh, you might as well have a two-meter antenna stuck to it. <laughs> the radio was down on the shelf underneath it. Here they were getting set up, had the analyzer out, wanted to make sure that all the antennas are working before they got on uh, 75. And they were ready for the evening. Uh, the tent was up and all of this. This was oh, probably about 1 or 2 o'clock, but the gals were there and ready to go also. The batteries were charged, and they got their Dr. Pepper and their iced tea all ready. They were ready to rock and roll. <laughs> uh, the Southwest Club always does a good job of telling the public w what's going on. They have a great setup uh, each year, and they were uh, on the QR. They had a QRP rig uh, from MFJ, and that that really works well. They uh, they made a lot of contacts on 20 meters. 
and that uh, that was the tent for the uh, QRP guys. Antennas were very easily uh, run up in the trees. This is the go-to station, and they had uh, had some really nice uh, nice contacts there. And as you can see, the operators are standing in line. Check out that antenna. How cool is this? It was a single wire that they threw up over a tree. And they put a choke uh, and a piece of plexiglass and tied it up to a, a 50 ohm. It worked great. There's a six meter antenna on top of the van. That really worked well. It was uh, an M squared hoop. And there's uh, there's Bill and Julie, and they were getting ready to make the old uh, first contacts on uh, on the go to station. Uh, they were out at, at a wonderful site. It was the elementary school there in Nixa. They let them have the whole, the whole yard. There's a, oh gosh, probably 40, 50 acres. And it was all theirs. And uh, one side of it had the uh, low freak. The other one had uh, HF. And that was really, really good. We, were, uh, we had a good time traveling around. I, I like to do those things and see what everybody's doing and uh, occasionally uh, stop and work a little bit. But that was our field day here. And I hope that you have a good field day and, and don't, don't just uh, uh, pack it up and say, okay, wait till next year. Do it again. Go out and have fun. Take your radios out once in a while. You don't have to go with anybody. You don't have to have a special occasion. Just take them out in the field somewhere and, have fun. You'll be amazed. You will be amazed at what all you can do with some wire antennas. You might even make an antenna out of an extension cable like Jason did last week. Don, uh, we're going to come back and listen to something you have to say about uh, DX engineering. And uh, then we're going to head off to the smoke and solder time. So here we go to Ohio to listen all about that great company called DX Engineering. But before we get into that, I want you to hear something real quick. You, you brought up your extension cord antenna. Uh, Ryan, go ahead and roll that beautiful bean footage and check out this antenna. <laughs> kilo, Kilo 4, Papa, Quebec X-ray. Gotcha. Kilo, Kilo 4, Papa, Quebec X-ray. I've got you here. I don't know if you're interested in signal reading, but that was a that was a good five seven five eight on the old Drake TR seven, which is really stingy. Uh, by the way, the name here is Christian Kazo SDH. A couple of my ham nation uh, brother and sister are joining us here as well. So uh, tell me a little bit about you. I don't I, I don't have your information. Where are you from? Where, who are you? Well, Christian, I am on the uh, the 100 watch on a wire Facebook page and uh, been listening to the podcast and really enjoy your work there and in the spirit of 100 watts on a wire this evening i'm feeding about 500 feet of rusty barbed wire about five feet off the ground for my antenna you are so is that sort of like a cow fence or something like that yes sir uh i'm coming out of my old uh 30 something year old Gentech transceiver into a Using an old uh, Dentron MT3000 cuter, and then I've got a piece of 300 ohm wire run out the window, and I put one side of the 300 ohm wire to the top piece of barbed wire, and one side, the other side of the wire to the to the bottom piece of barbed wire, and just been cutering the thing up and, and loading up uh, this 500 foot of fence, and uh, have been talking all over the place with it. I watched my dad use things like this, like the barbed wire and, and such, and clothes lines and just whatever was available for antennas uh, all of my life and uh, it, it just comes natural uh, uh, I've, I, I've actually uh, I tried one time to try and use railroad tracks but I just couldn't get just couldn't get it to work right well I am glad to hear, hear the things working I used this antenna uh, for the past uh, several days and did a clean sweep on the 13 colony specialist event uh, stations they were having. It really works well up and down the East Coast. Seven threes, guys. Kilo, Kilo, four. Papa, Quebec, X-ray, we're clear. Kilo, Kilo, here in Django Hotel. I really think that's what it's all about. I mean, who would have thought you used barbed wire for an outside? For the half, of course. 
Now that contact went on for about 11 minutes, on Bob. About 11 was, minutes, was, Bob. It was Christian. Uh, Amanda was on there, and I was on there, and uh, we just sat around and tossed him back and forth, and he was the loudest thing on the band. He's coming to Huntsville, so uh, hopefully, uh, maybe he'll bring a piece of barbed wire. Uh, David, if you're watching, we'll see you in about a month in Huntsville. So how you like that? That does that does that beat the uh, does that beat the home dipole, or is that uh, just about as good? What do you think about that? Yeah, that's cool. I remember back in the '50s, a lot of guys have beverage antennas with their. Uh, barbed wire fences so it's been around for many many decades that's great all yeah. right good stuff did a good job all right let's talk about dx engineering and you know it's it's uh, it's summertime and uh, bob's been getting a lot of rain up there we got a, a good bit as well and you know it is thunderstorm season i'm living proof of that because i got hit about uh, six weeks ago well dx engineering can make sure that you're ready uh, when the lightning starts flying around, DX Engineering has a huge selection of lightning protection and grounding solutions for your shack and antenna setups. Let me tell you something. This stuff is important. And if you need help, because you know, there's a bit of a learning curve on some of this stuff sometimes, well, call DX Engineering's tech support because they are happy to offer advice. They have the rotator control line protector. Lightning can get in any different kind of way, and your rotor control line is no different. This is an excellent way to ensure that your rotator is guarded against voltage spikes. Designed specifically for rotators and other control cables, it has eight individually shunt-protected terminals for your control wires. When the system receives a voltage spike greater than 82 volts of DC in either polarity, it automatically shunts the spike to ground uh, using an MOV for maximum surge protection. It's housed in a waterproof metal enclosure. Integrated mounting uh, grounding stud as well. It's easy to attach to a tower leg or a ground rod. Terminal gaskets uh, help keep the moisture issue uh, to a minimum. And uh, make sure your other equipment, including your tower, is properly grounded as well to ensure you have maximum protection from lightning voltage spikes. And DX Engineering has a wide array of grounding solutions from Erico, including copper bonded ground rods. These are 99.9% .9 perfect, pure, electrolytic copper coated. The cores are made from high carbon steel, which means they will not bend or distort when you're driving them into the ground. Available in uh, multiple outside diameters and lengths. And Erico's copper ground bar is the foundation for your shack's single point ground system. Quarter inch thick copper bar, 10 inches long, pre-drilled to accommodate your ring terminals. Grounding's important. It also comes with a pair of insulated mounting brackets to install it away from the shack's wall. There it is right there. This is good quality stuff, but of course you would expect that from DX Engineering. And so to tie your ground rods, uh, grounds together, look for uh, Georgia Copper Flexible Grounding Straps. They're... Uh, solid, bendable metal strips connect to your power supplies, equipment racks, amplifiers, and other ham radio equipment. Uh, this ensures near zero voltage differential, which gives you a uniform path to ground. Select from a wide range of Georgia copper strap widths, thicknesses, and lengths. That's the one thing I have not finished yet in building my new station is all of the grounding. But I'm working on it, believe me, because I don't want to do this again. I've been a ham for 20 years, and I've had one lightning strike, and believe me, if I go another 40 or 50 between uh, lightning strikes, that will not be soon enough. The X Engineering ships faster than anybody else in the industry. If you get your order in by 10 p.m. Eastern and if it's in stock, it'll be on a truck headed your way tonight. Proven products, expert advice, DX Engineering. They're friendly folks, and they live to help you with your ham radio stuff. You shrink the globe with your ham radio, and DX Engineering is there to help. Grab your catalog or shop online 24-7 at dxengineering.com slash hamnation, dxengineering.com slash hamnation. They're great friends of of Ham Nation and great friends of all of us, and we uh, we just appreciate their friendship and their support uh, so much more than than we could ever ever say. And uh, another good friend of ours is uh, a couple of hours up to my north, up in the, the Jackson, Mississippi area. And what's going on with Smoke and Solder tonight, uh, George? Good to see you tonight. Well, hi, Don. Uh, two more of your friends here. Look who I found. Ah, it's a uh, Mr. Novak. How you doing, Greetings, Chief? sir? Good to see you. Yeah, we, we've been having fun here um, watching the show and uh, playing with the pencils on the Group W bench. But uh, and, and Ray doesn't know what I'm talking about. He's too young. Some some of you will. But we've had some pretty fun comments with what's been going on at the show. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I tell you what. You know, Bob asked me to, to show a little something this week that uh, I talked about a, a while back over on Ham College. It's um, a simple subject uh, for the beginners. and uh, I thought yeah. you were going to say grounding for a moment. 
nope, nope, we stay, stay clear of grounding. Uh, and, and like Don there, you know, he's only had one lightning strike. He's due at least to have a dozen more yet, I think. Uh, not anytime soon. You shut your <laughs> pie hole, both of you. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. Yes, That's connect. I don't want to hear no more hooey from either of you about that. Thank you very much. I'm done. Done with lightning. Yeah, I hear you. I don't blame you, Don. All right, well, we'll be back in just a minute, but uh, let's take a look at this uh, video now on making a Morse code sounder. Morse code is most popular among amateur radio operators, although it's no longer required for licensing in most countries. We mentioned about the key, you got to have that to send it. Yep. But you got to have something to hear it with, too. And you said right. a pair of ears, but yep. I said a receiver. Why don't we build something like that and just, you know, I it, just it's so very primitive. Yeah, but uh, but it's actually, actually what we're about to build is, is probably very similar to, to what they used back then. Yeah, they just didn't steal their metal off the back of computers. Yeah, well, they should have. It, yeah. it works really yeah. well. <laughs> Wouldn't want to use it for anything anyway. So, uh, oh boy, we just happen to have some parts here, don't yeah. we? Yeah, hey, I got it. We're going to need some tools. Yeah, I found a screwdriver. Yeah, me too. What, what about this uh, cover for an expansion card for a computer? Yeah, back of a computer, I'm and sure that's probably what they use. Here's a couple of pieces of wood that they're kind of stuck together. We'll just use them Ooh, like that. L-shaped, yeah. I've got some screws yeah. here. How about What about a little wire? That wire I wound up on a nail to keep it handy? Yeah, yeah that makes work. a good place to keep your wire. Yeah, it does. Yeah, I'm just going to kind of stick it in this hole right here for right now. Yeah, why don't you do that? All right, so you're sticking the nail in the wood. Yep, the, put the, the nail in the wood. You've got to have it someplace. And that's just a, a bunch of wire just kind of coiled up on a nail and the two ends of the wire hanging free here. Yeah. Right. And we're going to need the key. Actually, the, actually, that's this is going to be... This is, that's going to be... Uh, that's going to be the noise maker. Turn it upside down. It was custom bent just to fit that nail. It was? Well... Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's go ahead and tighten that down. And they didn't have electric screwdrivers in those days, so that's why we're not using one. That's why we went structure. primitive with it. Yeah. Have you got how much gap you got there? Uh, maybe, maybe you got a little more gap than. We'll just have to see if that works. That's we can always adjust. That is some some distance between there. You can do a custom adjustment on it. Needs to be almost. That that might work. Okay. All so right. so that's the receiver. Right. Well, I'm gonna build the transmitter then. All right. All right. So what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna take my piece of wood and uh, one of these covers off the back plane of a computer here and I'm going to just screw it down to the wood. I've got a piece of wire here. Is this how Viberplex got started? You know it could be. I'm not sure they may have been around before computers so they had to get their metal from somewhere else. <laughs> I'm just going to take a screw and I'm going to stick the wire down in a hole here. Let me see if you can see that. There's a hole in the wood I'm just going to stick the wire down in there and I'm going to tighten up a screw over it. And then I'm going to uh, take this piece of metal and just screw it there and leave a little gap in there. This is essentially a switch, you know, when you push down on it, it makes contact and the electricity can get on through. And Tommy, you've got you've got a wire over there with nothing on it on your receiver, don't you? You got a wire you're not doing anything with. I got one here that doesn't have anything on it. You want to borrow this one? Yeah, let me borrow that one. If you would, just slip it under the corner of that metal there. Maybe I need to loosen up the metal a little. Huh? There you go. All right. Maybe we'll just... that'll hold it good and snug till I figure out what I want to do with there it. There you go. I'm not, I'm not hearing anything over there. No, but we got some other wires here. Maybe we ought to do something with that. Well, I got just happened to have this old 12 volt. What is it? Seven and a half ampere hour battery. Yeah, is that from a? 
that's from a game feeder from back in the 1780s. Yeah, I think this thing was actually used to make arcs on a file. This <laughs> It's an inside <laughs> joke, but it actually was. Yeah. Okay, so you want to put this one on the positive? Yeah, it doesn't matter where you put it. Yeah. All right, I'm going to sit it kind of back here out of the way. Knocked our transmitter or our receiver over. You know, this wire I've got just happened to have one of these clips on the end of it here, too, so I'm going to hook it to the other terminal of the battery. And now, before we go any further, let me just say you probably shouldn't be doing this with a 12 volt, 7.5 ampere hour battery. Yeah. You should probably be using uh, maybe a 6 volt lantern battery or something like that because this this can get hot. Right. So, well, let's see. If I push it down and, and close the circuit here, let's see if anything happens over on your side, Tommy. Hey. Hold on a minute. My receiver's receiving. I want to send you a, a call here. This was actually should have been sent before the show started today. Yeah. Your, uh, your transmitter's making fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my, don't get any don't get any paper near it I could use this for an arc gap too could yeah I, or spark gap now it, with this big battery here this metal gets a little warm here you don't want to hold down on this no but you can see it works out pretty good. yeah this, this battery's really got too much current but with this only one we had so yeah yeah so there you go there's our homemade telegraph station we can use it for long distance communications. Oh, like, uh, what, three feet yeah, here? Yeah, across the table. Yeah. Yeah, and if one of us really knew code, we could send Morse code back and forth. I sent SOS a while ago, but uh, probably a pretty poor SOS. I would have been called a ham. Yeah. So uh, this is, they actually used one wire transmitters. They did? One, one, wire, one wire telegraph. All right, so, so how they did they complete the circuit? I don't know, but that's what it said. It said one wire. It must have been that the other post of the battery must have gone to ground. That would have been the only way I could think of it. A neat little project. I built one of these when I was a kid, and I, th I thought it would be something interested for uh, new hams to look at. And, you know, very simple. You can yeah. make this wire much longer. And, oh, absolutely. Yeah. A lot longer. And uh, when I was a kid, I used to be fascinated by electromagnets, which that's mm -hmm. what the whole thing works off the principle of. But yeah. uh, I used to make those all the time, playing hey, around. You know, I think I want to hang on to these parts here because there's probably some experiments we can do in the future that that we can use some of this stuff for right here. Yeah, and if it gets cold in here this winter, you can just send a, yeah. hit that key a few times. Yeah, I'm going to have to warm up my finger. Yeah, I've got you a little heater. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so there you go, a homemade telegraph key and... Uh, I think you call it sender and receiver, but I'm not sure about that. So maybe somebody will straighten us out on that. Yep. So there you go, Ray. That was from the pilot episode of Ham College that uh, sometime toward the end of last year. Now, it had been interesting to see what kind of receiver action you would have got. Instead of the coil of wire, it was a coils in Tommy's seat that you were energizing. That, and we could have used a little more voltage. But you know. I bet it would be more than clicking going on. <laughs> <laughs> it would be, you know, that that would be a real sounder. Actually, that coil of wire there we were using uh, to to make what I called a sounder or a receiver or probably any number of things. We did another experiment with that a little later. We turned that into a transmitter. So that that was a lot of fun. I don't know if you've seen that, but uh, it, not yet. It, it was kind of kind of interesting. You you can do a lot with a uh, I don't know a coil of wire and a nail. It's dangerous to see you and Tommy get together and experimenting. <laughs> I've seen your field day footage already tonight, and that that, that was a comic reel there. That, that was a, a sneak preview there uh, I gave Ray earlier. You know, Tommy and I did field day out in the woods again uh, this, well, a couple of weeks ago. And, well, we had a great time. We did some new things we have not done before. I've kind of teased them here. We're going to be, um, well, we're actually going to stream that. Saturday night while we're shooting at about 7 p.m. Central Daylight Time on uh, live.amateurlogic.tv. Come over and watch, and you'll learn a, a kind of, I don't know, I wouldn't say the mountain man way because we don't have any mountains around here, but um, 
And for those that are not from the South, I think Tommy has a good educational section about poison ivy. Yes, yes, that's in there, as as well as several other things you want to know. Makes me itch just thinking about yep. that one. Yeah, <laughs> you'll have to tune in and uh, and see what happened there. But anyway, uh, we had a great time there. I got uh, well a question I asked last week, Ray. And when we were talking about field day uh, last week, and I said for field day, you know, my group operated as class three alpha. What does that mean? And we had a winner. It was uh, Roxy Claus K1 AUS. And Roxy said three alpha means that you're running three transmitters on emergency power. And if I can reach the prize here, Roxy, we're going to send you this MFJ telescopic antenna with a BNC connector on the end of it. Yeah, I'm not going to poke you in the eye. Oh, I was thinking you'd go ahead and it's flexible. It. They call this a, a scanner or a receiver antenna. You could actually use it on a uh, handy talkie for two meters or 440 if you wanted to. Um, no, no place to connect it, right? No, a good back scratcher, too. Well, it is. It's good, very good for that. Maybe um, we should let Martin have that idea and they could repackage it. But anyway. I, I've got another question for um, for next week's contest. What was the first public telegram in America? Yeah, it's it's a pretty famous quote there. Um, if you think you know that, send the answer to me, hamnationcontest at gmail.com, and you might win this Howl Sound cap and a Howl Sound T-shirt. Still in the wrapper here. Size extra small? Uh, this is a size medium, but I have a variety of sizes there, so we'll just see what the winner wants. But uh, hamnationcontest at gmail.com. Send me your answer. What was the first public telegram in America? And you could win. Well, I got a little update on Randy. You know, we haven't heard anything from him lately, Ray. And he's rolling, rolling, rolling. He, he's been on the road. Uh, going on his second month now. Uh, this time he's headed out to Oshkosh, Wisconsin for the big Experimental Aircraft Association air show. And it, you can track him uh, on real-time maps as he drives along at aprs.fi slash k7age-1. Or um, he's going to be posting contacts on his or comments and pictures as well on his uh, Twitter account, twitter.com slash k7age, if you'd like to follow him there. And once he gets to the campsite, he's hoping he'll be able to get on uh, 20 and 40 meters. So maybe you'll catch him on the air. But uh, it sounds like Randy is having one heck of a summer to me. It does, and I hope he makes it down to the Warbirds at Oshkosh because we, we've we been working with the guys down there for quite a few years. And they'll have a... Um, Things are going to have a 7600 on a butternut vertical there. So, cool. Yeah, you know, um, I I haven't talked to him recently, but uh, there's a good chance that uh, Dan in 9 LVS, the guy who does our wiki, may be there because he's he lives in Wisconsin. He's big in, you know, to the air show type of thing. Oh, yeah. I think I've heard him talk about this particular show before. And so they have a. Uh, they will have a special event station, too. I mean, yep. uh, the last mm -hmm. few years, I think it was out at the Pioneer Hangar. So it's always a fun place to go take a look at it. bunch of great guys up there. And maybe get Thank on the you. air and work a few cues. Yeah. Could be a lot of fun. Speaking of fun, I think we've had all that's allowed by law right here for now, Ray. So let's throw it back to Don. We'll be back a little later in the show for the chat room portion there. See if you can come up with some questions for Amanda in the meantime there. But uh, Don, take it away. Thank you, sir. You guys are uh, doing a fine job there in spite of yourselves. Uh, we don't have Newsline <laughs> tonight, but we're working on getting, uh, in fact, we're hoping uh, this week uh, to have Newsline resume. So we're close. We're getting there. We're working on it. We're working hard. So hopefully uh, this time next week we'll have another Newsline, uh, Ham Nation headlines. But in the meantime, we do have Dr. Tamitha Scove. 
Hi, I'm Tam at the Scove with your solar storm forecast for the week of June 9th. Coming down off that huge series of flares and solar storm that we had just a, almost a couple weeks ago now, we really have seen the sun die down in activity. It is littered with uh, active regions, but all we've really seen are some filament and prominence eruptions. We do have uh, some wind from this small coronal hole that we're expecting, and region 2381 has popped off a few M-class flares, but other than that, we really haven't seen too much. Switching to our M-flare threat meter, you can see the last in that huge set of, of M-flares back on the 25th, but since then things have died down with that region rotating behind the backside, and things have stayed pretty quiet. We had a little activity uh, with a very small M-class flare on the 3rd, and then things died back down again, and now region 2381 is kicking activity back up with the largest flare being a one point, M1.7, but it is since showing signs of decay, and so most likely, unless it grows again, we won't see any more M-flares. Now, we have seen some solar radiation storms recently. We actually peaked up at an S3 level back when we had that huge solar storm, and then things kind of died down, but they didn't go away. We've been hovering around the S1 storm level for quite a few days until things finally died down about the beginning of the month, and then we popped back up in the beginning of July for one more little round where it was enhancement, but things have finally died down, and so the amateur radio, radio bands and GPS operations should be pretty good now. Switching to your solar storm conditions, here's that gorgeous G4 storm we had back on the 23rd that gave us aurora as far south as San Jose, California. I'll show that in a minute. Since then, things have quieted down for the most part. We had uh, a nice little show uh, on the 5th and the 6th of July, uh, which was kind of obscured because of that horrible fire in Canada, so we didn't get many aurora shots because of that. And since then, things have continued to quiet down, and we're just waiting for the next one to hit. And that huge solar storm back on the 23rd gave us aurora pretty much all over the world. Here, for example, is New Zealand and the Channel Islands in the UK. We got aurora in Cornwall, and here's 30,000 feet on a flight to Europe. We had aurora in Canada. People actually had to look south for the aurora. We had it in Moosehood, Maine, also gorgeous colors in Winslow, and in upstate New York. We had coronas over Lake Superior and also over Hartford, Wisconsin. We had gorgeous aurora high in the sky in New Hampshire. We had it in gorgeous colors in Billings, Montana that filled the sky. We had aurora in Iowa and as far south as North Georgia and Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania and also clear down in San Jose. Returning to the disk, you can see we actually have quite a few active regions in Earth view right now, but none of them have manifested any really large M-class flares. Re the big players have been region 2376 and now region 2381 because it's popped off a few M-class flares, but it is actually showing signs of decay, so we're not expecting anything big uh, from it until it begins to grow again. Uh, region 2384 is the newest player that's come onto the disk, and it actually let off a prominence eruption uh, just a, a day or so ago, so we'll be watching it because as it rotates in the Earth strike zone, it may light off a solar storm that will be Earth directed. Switching to your solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating some fast wind from a coronal hole that's just now entering Earth strike zone. NOAA is giving us about a 40% chance for a major storm at high latitudes on the 10th, with storming to continue into the 11th. Now at mid-latitudes, we're only expecting about a 30% chance for active conditions, with storming to continue into the 11th, so there are some aurora possibilities. But as the week continues, things should die down, and uh, we're not anticipating any other solar storms at this time. Switching to your solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the coming week, we do have regions 2376 and 2381, which have fired some large class flares. So NOAA is keeping our M class flare risk up at 45% with the uh, possibility of decaying uh, over the next few days. It depends upon what region 2381 does. As far as solar radiation storms are concerned, we're all in the green. We're not anticipating any uh, proton storms to hit us anytime soon. So this week, the activity level is not at a low to a moderate level. The sun has had a few spits and starts, but nothing that's really manifested any big flares or any huge Earth-directed solar storms. Now, we are anticipating that fast wind from the coronal hole that's just entering the Earth strike zone, and that should hit us in the next day or two, and that could bring some aurora possibilities, mostly up at mid-latitudes, but maybe down at lower latitudes. Nothing like the G4 storm that we had just a couple weeks ago. But it may degrade the hand bands just a little bit, and I doubt that it's going to affect anything with GPS. But outside of that, 
everything should be pretty calm and I guess take a break and enjoy the quiet. I'm Tamara the Scove. Thank you for watching. Thanks, Dr. T. Appreciate that. And uh, getting back to Newsline just for a sec uh, before we move on, the Young Ham of the Year Award will be presented this year as well, and that will be at the Huntsville, Alabama Ham Fest. That is the third weekend in August the 15th, I believe, is that Saturday. So uh, I'll be there, and hopefully we'll see you as well. And uh, Ray Novak will be there, of course, with ICOM, and let's go ahead and get a word from them, shall we? ICOM America and ICOM Canada are teaming up to offer ham radio operators some incredible savings. Get a great deal on a D-Star repeater direct from ICOM and help expand D-Star across North America. With the release of the ID-51A Plus and ID-5100A, more people are getting on the air with D-Star. For a limited time, ICOM is offering a bi-direct D-Star promotion for U.S. and Canadian residents only. Purchase the D-Star repeater through the D-Star infrastructure program. Visit ICOM America's website, view current amateur promotions, and buy direct. This promotion is good for a limited time only. Review complete instructions online and call or email in your order today. Visit icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information on ICOM's bi-direct program. And you can tune in and enter to win after each episode of Ham Nation. Go to icomamerica.com slash ham nation. Yes. Uh, throw your name in the hat. You could win some great swag prizes like ICOM t-shirts or hats. And you can also learn how you could win the monthly grand prize drawing. Uh, for July, the grand prize is going to be the ID31A compact 5-watt UHF handy talkie with submersible construction, analog, and D-Star operation built-in GPS, micro SD card slot, and a lot more. So go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation after this episode and each episode of Ham Nation and register to win. Sign up, good luck, and don't forget to follow Icom America Incorporated on Facebook and Twitter. Ray, I think, I think it's time to get Dale in here. We haven't talked to Dale recently, and I know he's got something special for us tonight. Oh, that's great. It's been a while since I've hey. seen him, too. Thank Hi, you, George. Sure do have a lot of uh, information, some field day photos from uh, all over the country. But I wanted to show you this, uh, the uh, HN200 uh, wow. <laughs> people, the uh, net control people are going to be very busy uh, the, this next weekend and the weekend after that. Uh, there's about 145 QSL cards I've received here already for... Uh, W0H, and just the other day, I received from Amanda out in uh, Colorado, a fantastic job she did on printing the uh, QSL cards. Uh, here's the one for W0H. They're all basically the same, but the call signs are different colors, so if you display them in a uh, frame, uh, they'll all stand out uh, in their own individual way, so that should be really cool. And uh, on the 4th of July, I picked up uh, the uh, clean sweep uh, stickers. If I can get it in front of the camera there. They are transparent. They will go on your certificate for the Ham Nation Bicentennial event broadcast. Should be a lot of fun. I'll have those out to Steve here. Uh, I'll ship them out in the next, uh, either tomorrow or the next day. And uh, he's going to be a busy lad out uh, in Washington too. So anyway, tonight it's uh, all field day all the time and let's get started with a nice video featuring the whiskey nine zulu lima field day that's in wisconsin ham nation wiki editor dan in 9 lvs has the report amateur radio field day was june 27th and 28th 2015 the Foxy's Amateur Radio Club held its event at the Outer Gimme Cohen Conservation Club in Hortonville, Wisconsin, which is just seven miles northwest of Appleton. P 
people started arriving at the Otagami County Conservation Club about 3 o'clock on Friday. The Otagami County Conservation Club is a great place to have an event like this. Then we started setting up as more and more people started to arrive. The go to station arrived and the setup could begin. One of the first things that we started to do was set up the tent for the 2 Alpha station. And just that quick, the tent was set up. The tent was for the Voice and CW stations. For power, we used a small forklift battery supplied by SBS Battery. Saturday morning, we started to get the equipment set up. The GOTA station got set up very quickly and used the rotatable dipole as its main antenna. It was one of the first places the people stopped when they came to the field day event. And one thing every field day station should have is a soldering station. In this case, I think Tony's working on a little surface mount stuff. Not really. He's actually making a power connection that just got a little weak over time. Once the soldering was done, it was just a quick matter of getting the rigs hooked up and get everything tuned up and ready to go. We started out field day with Jim, WB9OJE, and Jack, KK0I, at the CW station. And Derek, KG8RF, and Roy, KC9VLP, were at the voice station. And at the GOTA station, we had a nice demo of digital operation, as well as getting some new people to amateur radio on the air. One Delta, South Texas. One Delta. And Jack, KK0I, showed some kids how to do CW. Okay, here. I'll show you what. This is a dash, and that's a dot. Or this is a da, and that's a dip. So a long one is called a dash. Okay, B is is a dash and three dips. Okay, da dip dip dip. Can you write that underneath there? Just put it right on that line right there. Yeah, a dash, and then three little dips. Dip dip dip. One, two, three. Okay. John took his shot at the HF voice station and made some good contacts. As it got later into the evening, Gary and Terry took over the HF voice station. Whiskey 9 Zulu Lima. Whiskey 9 Zulu Lima. Whiskey 9 Zulu Lima. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. You are 2 Alpha Wisconsin, 2 Alpha Whiskey India. Okay, thank you. Good luck. And Gary took over the HF CW station for the overnight. And in the morning, Jack was right back at the CW station. Special thanks goes out to Tony for organizing the W9ZL Field Day event, as well as Al for cooking all that great food. Also, special thanks goes out to Amanda from the Outagamie County Conservation Club, as well as SBS Batteries, who supplied us with the battery for the W9ZL Field Day event. And that's it from W9ZL Field Day 2015. Well, Dan, thank you very much for another timely video. Well, on field day, Esther and I were on a tour bus in California. And as it happened, our bus pulled into the driveway at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library 15 minutes before field day started. So uh, to my surprise, there were seven or eight tents and as many antennas surrounding the entrance to the Presidential Library. Only had about 15 to 20 minutes before I had to be inside, but I managed to grab a few photos. After we got back to Kansas, we jumped on Facebook and Twitter, put out a call for field day photos, and almost immediately we had nearly four dozen photos. And right now, here's Show Me Your Field Day. Tonight, it's Show Me Your Field Day. We have four dozen photos from all over the United States. So let's get this turkey in the air. Our bus tour stopped at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library just 15 minutes before field day 2015 started. As we pulled up, I was happy to see seven or eight tents and as many antennas. The Ventura County Amateur Radio Society and the semi-settlers ARC had joined forces. Here, Mike, WA6FXT, keeps the log after Field Day 2015 got underway. 
I only had about 15 minutes to shoot as our group was due to have lunch in 20 minutes on the opposite end of the presidential library. At the second tent, I ran into Dwayne, KD6AF, the 40-meter post-show net regular, and his sidekick. Another tent, another three field day operators, and there was another tent set up right along the sidewalk leading to the presidential library entrance. And the two clubs had arranged to bring old-time radios for the visitors to remember. And here's the antenna they were using on 20 meters at November 6, Romeo. Well, Dave, WB5NHL, sent us photos of a unique field day facility. Would you believe Horse MCOM? Here's the trailer, and here's the CW operator, Carl, KP2L. He volunteered his two-horse trailer for the field day operation. And this is Kevin in for XL, operating the digital modes. Meanwhile, in Kansas, the Marshall County ARC in Marysville operated W0GCJ. Mike AC0I sent us this great HDR sunset shot. A Bruce WA1UTQ sent us lots of photos of field day at the Villages in Florida. They had a 20-meter beam on a single sideband and a 40- to 10-meter beam dedicated to CW. After getting the antennas up, they took time out for barbecue and tea in the shade. K4VRC operated on 40 through 10. They even worked some stations on 80 meters. And there were some digital operators also. Here's their mobile van and 40 to 10 meter beam, the one they used on single sideband. Well, Roger, KJ6WSO sent us some great photos from the deck of the USS Hornet. The Hornet Amateur Radio Club used the special call sign November 6 Hotel. Here's John K6ZKI operating an ICOM 7600 from the flight deck. And the signal flags displaying the club call sign November Bravo 6 Golf Charlie. In northern Wisconsin, the Rhinelander Repeater Association and the Villas County Amateur Radio Club Two newly formed clubs held a joint field day operation. Mike KC9ZJF provided the photos. Back down in Olathe, Kansas, the Santa Fe Trail ARC operated field day from Ensor Park and Museum. Here's their GOTA station in zero in K. And here's a club member operating from their communications trailer parked under some tall cedar trees on the front lawn. Well, Jeff, KD5QDO, sent us pictures of his daughter, Chloe, working the night shift at W5SSV in Netherland, Texas. And Van, KM4TC, sent a photo of his daughter, Sarah, KM4GKT, enjoying her first field day. She was operating 20 meters at the Johnston Amateur Radio Society field day in Coates, North Carolina. Meanwhile, in Wichita, Joe KB0KFH operates PSK31 at the Joint Bears Work Field Day. And James N5GUI provided the digital station, and he elmered Joe through the process. The field day plan for special event station W1V was to operate from Gayhead Light in Massachusetts, but too soon the weather hit. And the simulated emergency turned into a true emergency. At the request of the National Weather Service in Totten, they relocated from the tents to the public restrooms at the light and operated throughout the storm using generator power. Todd, in for USS, sent us uh, the short video clip at the beginning of the presentation. He also sent these photos from the Lynchburg Amateur Radio Club field day. Here's Bill, KC4D, operating. And in another part of the room, Dave, KV4JK, operates. The group ran 2A. They made 1,661 QSOs, 1090 on CW. And here's the portable antenna that got the job done. That's it for Show Me Your Field Day 2015 style. Remember to send your shack photos to Ham Nation videos at TWIT.com. TV.
Well, thanks to everyone who emailed in their Field Day 2015 photos so fast. And we'll be back next Wednesday with the next installment of Show Me Your Shack. We've had that one on deck for quite a while. And there are a lot of uh, nice uh, ham shacks to be seen. Hopefully, uh, we'll also have a graphical look at the metadata from the Ham Nation 200 event uh, real soon. In the meantime, email the link to your videos and your shack photos to Ham Nation videos at TWIT.tv. And if you operated in the Ham Nation special event, uh, all of us have our QSL cards. Uh, if you haven't uh, sent one yet, get that SASE to us and uh, we'll get you one of these commemorative cards. Well, it's time to check in now with Amanda over in Canyon City in Colorado. Find out what's happening in the chat room. Uh, good evening, Amanda, and uh, thanks for the great job on the QSL cards. Uh, take it away. Well, thank you, Dale. And really, you did all the hard work. Um, I just did the printing. So, hey, and uh, not everyone has their cards yet because evidently some places like Zion, Illinois, for some reason, evidently is so rural that it takes four to five days for them to get there. So, she Miss Cheryl, you'll be getting your cards very, very soon, I hope. And um, have a great night there, Dale. And uh, you're going to be busy for a while sending out some cards. I know because I've sent out at least uh, 50 to 75 now and uh, you're, yeah, you're going to be busy. But hey, let's move on over. We've got Katie here tonight. Katie, it's so great to have you on the show. Thanks, Amanda. It's awesome to be here. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to do, I know it's not a ladies night and hello, Ray. I, I know you're, you exist. You do. Um <laughs> Just a little bit, but it's it's really an honor to have Katie here. And um, so I'm going to go with the spirit of the ladies. A lot of the guys in the chat room are like, wow. So you guys are like top operators. How do I get my wife into this or my girlfriend? So Katie, give us the rundown. When were you licensed? And um, what got you involved in ham radio? And give us at least one tip on how to help other ladies get into the hobby. All right, I'm writing all this down so I remember. Okay, well, I got my <laughs> license <laughs> in 2006. And honestly, I got into the hobby because it was a job requirement to get my license. I was working for the AWRL in Connecticut as the membership manager, and I had to get my license. Well, I went to field day right after that. I started in April of 2006 and went to field day as a go to station at W1AW. And I really was like, holy cow, this is awesome. And then the following month, this actually, this coming weekend was the HF contest. And I played in that with Dan and 1ND. And that really pulled me in. And I knew I was hooked for life, that this was just the, the funnest thing to do. And um, as far as getting other women involved, that's something that I'm always trying to encourage. Um, I always like to tell women that, you know, hey, first of all, there's a lot less of us on the air. So we always have a better shot of getting through the pileups. But, you know, it, it is kind of fun being one of the fewer women in the boys crowd, I have to say. Um, you know, you don't have to be scared. And um, getting on the getting on the air is just so cool and i love meeting people from all over the world it's just the the greatest thing ever i agree and uh thank you so much um that's really so you came from the east coast is that correct you don't originally come from wyoming that is correct i am from uh, connecticut actually um, where we're heading back to next week i'm from uh, windsor which is the oldest town in connecticut it's kind of funny. It was formed in 1633, and I move out here to Wyoming, which is barely a little over 100 years old. Uh, so, yeah, I was really lucky to, and I used to live about a mile away from W1AW, which made for a nice short commute. Oh, yeah, definitely. Now, Val, I'm going to send you the same question because I'm not sure that we've heard your complete background. Um, so if you remember the questions, uh, go ahead and take it. Well, I originally, my daughter and I, we got our ticket together in 2006 and um, just a bunch of guys at work that I hung out with, all the geeks down in tech support, uh, all got their ticket. None of them knew anybody in at ham radio, but uh, it sounded interesting. So I said, what the heck, I'll go get my ticket. And um, as far as um, getting other women involved, we need, we do need more women and, and men 
you, you like um, it, uh, Katie said you're you're kind of rare out there. So you're kind of like your own rare DX, even though we're in the States and it's fun and you can bust the pileups and you do have an advantage when searching and pouncing and contests and things like that. But I would say as far as getting a while involved or even a guy involved, you have to kind of find out what they're passionate about. I mean, like a lot of women like the public service aspect of it, or if they're competitive, then they may like the contesting or DXing, or if, they, if they're if they very talkative, they might like the rag chew part of it. I mean, so just try and find out what, they, what aspect of that hobby you think that they might be interested in and kind of go after it from that angle. That's about all I can say. That's, that's great. Now, I, I just have to tell you guys, Jeff was licensed in 2007 and um, the biggest thing that he had said was, I don't think she's interested. I don't think she can get her license. And that was it. It was game over. So I said, all right, I'm getting my ticket now. <laughs> and Challenge. <laughs> that's right. So sometimes a challenge can be helpful. And you know, you, you guys know your um, wife, girlfriend or husband um, best. So you know which way to approach them. So it's always kind of a fun um, trick. And MCOM was, yeah, I was not into MCOM at all until we had a fire here and they actually needed our help. And then I was really interested in it. So I definitely, I'm just a rag chewer. I love to talk. I love to meet people. So um, with that in mind, hey, why don't we find out Ray's background as well? Ray, do you want to tell us uh, how you got into ham radio? Actually, it was a job requirement right out of college. I started working at MFJ in Starkville, Mississippi. And actually, uh, Tim Duffy at K3LR asked me the exact same question in an interview with him last week for DX Engineering. Oh, that's funny. Um, and George, uh, I don't know that we've ever heard your complete background. Go ahead and give us the same um answer the same question. I got uh, my, my first uh, commercial FCC license in 1972 when uh, I was in high school and went to work as a DJ and then translation on through to uh, ended up with a, a general radio telephone license. But I didn't get a ham license until 1991. I had uh, wanted to have been, uh, you know, a ham back in the 70s, but I didn't really know any Back then, there were none in the small town I grew up in. It was because of the 60s. The 60s? Blame it well, on the it, 60s. It could have been, yeah. But I knew what ham radio was because I had seen it in Poplar Electronics magazine. But uh, anyway, you know, I was a teenager and working at a radio station, going to school, playing in a band. And I just, I don't know, I didn't take the time to do it. But I did in 91, and I'm glad I did. Very cool. Well, we, we are, we're all very appreciative that you got licensed. That's for sure, George. You've, uh, you've taught us all a lot. And I just, I'm going to go over one more question here. Where do we go from here? Val, what are you looking forward to now that you've met all of these goals that you have? And uh, then after that, pass it to Katie and let her answer the same thing. Go ahead. Well, I've never reached my goals. <laughs> I'm only at 300 countries, so I still need to get 41 more. I started doing a grid square hunting, so I'm working on that. Also, uh, I'm probably going to work on county hunting. I would like to try. Um, we're getting a huge six-meter uh, antenna put up, and um, and I, I, I would like to start working on uh, meter scatter and EME, and, you know, moon bounce, things like that, and try, and try other aspects of the hobby that I haven't really tried. So, so many things to do and so little time. I'll never reach a goal. <laughs> Very good. And Katie, what about you? Yeah, I actually agree completely with Val. It's, you know, there's so many things about ham radio. And if you ever get tired of ham radio, then you're not trying hard enough to find something to do. Um, I actually have been really trying to learn a little bit more about building stuff. I built an antenna ages ago, but I'd really love to do more about that. Um, I'm finding I actually really do enjoy some of the technical things. Um, of course, I'm always wanting to add more countries and um, like Val, we've, we've got a new six meter beam that's going up on our new tower and I'd like to try some of that as well. And I'm also really interested in trying out satellites. I've never um, contacted or done anything with a satellite. I think that would be kind of fun. So just kind of looking forward and trying some new things. That's very cool. And uh, my outlook right now is um, introducing people that are not hams into ham radio. And also the satellite thing is really appealing to me. Um, except for that 
Jeff and I try to do it together and sometimes we almost choke each other. So the completely different story, <laughs> couples therapy, um, another time. <laughs> Anyhow, hey, <laughs> that's all I got. And I know I've extended this a really long ways out, but it's been really lovely talking to you two ladies. And, um, and Amanda, this is a safe space. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess he's out of the room. Okay, we're good. Um, um, George and Ray, if you can take it from there, I give it to you. We don't stand a chance on taking no. it from there. <laughs> we'll make up stage left. Yeah. Uh, well, girls, thanks for being here. It, it was great to, to have you all here tonight. And uh, I know everyone enjoyed it. Uh, we'll have to try to do this again. Oh, yeah. Agreed. Uh, yeah. We've uh, we kind of lost Bob and Don and Dale in the shuffle, but that's OK. Uh, Ray and I are, are still here trying to represent, but um, the, I don't know, Ray. No, uh, we don't stand a chance. No. The pile up, they've got it. So, yep, yep. <laughs> well, uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. We had a, a great episode tonight. Uh, look forward to seeing everyone again next week. I'm not sure exactly what we've got going then. Uh, so we'll have to see over the coming few days. But, Ray, thank you for being here. Oh, I've enjoyed it. And, um, well, Katie, thanks for, for joining us tonight. And, of course, uh, Val and Amanda and Dale and Bob and Don. Boy, we had a lot of folks on tonight. Yes, we have. Did yeah. I miss anyone? Poor Brian. Uh, yeah, Brian. you don't have to tell me twice. <laughs> yeah. He's he's already turned off the lights and ready to go home. They they've shut down the studio already. I don't think I need to go home. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, let's not forget the nets. Yes, uh, the nets tonight. I did not get the forty meter frequency. Did anyone uh, happen to catch that? Um, it's going to be somewhere around seventy two, seventy eight, maybe. Plus or minus 10, you'll find it if you go look. Uh, the 20-meter net's on 14.287. I know that because I did see that in the chat room. Uh, you can join Cheryl on 80 meters, uh, 38.47, or some people would call that 75 meters. There you go. Uh, you can also uh, join us on Echo Link at uh, star do drop in star node number 355-800 or D-star on reflector 14 module C and if you don't have a D-star radio you can listen at hamnationdstar.net well thanks for being here everyone see you again next week have a good one 73 good night everybody 73 good night 88 bye everybody